Triggered AF family, we are back again, back again, back again. How are you feeling, Danny? I'm feeling great. I'm feeling great. I'm so excited uh, for the conversation. It's definitely going to be interesting. <laughs> Listen, I, I am always excited for conversations that push the envelope, that um, don't play nice. I like uncomfortable conversations, not necessarily uncomfortable for me, but uncomfortable for uh, some viewers who have really, really strong opinions about um, just all the things, because, you know, our triggered AF family, y'all be triggered as fuck. Mm -hmm. um, but I must say for y'all who are not watching the YouTube, Danny, this hair, though, is everything. I, I'm getting my life. I had to switch it up on y'all. <laughs> I'm getting my whole life. <laughs> And I cannot wait because our guest today, I am loving his hair too. He shocked me and showed me he got it colored a little bit. So I was like, well, okay, then I see you, you flying fancy. And so I'm super, super excited to have today uh, my twin, one of my favorite, favorite people. Um, from the moment we met, I think it was in Miami, we literally just clicked and vibed and it's been family ever since. So I am super excited to have today actor and author, Ben Carlton, I want you to come up to the stage. We are about to have such a dope conversation. And hey. Hey, hey how you doing? Good. How are you? I am amazing here in hot behind Austin, Texas. <laughs> um, on a on a tour stop, it's 120 degrees. Wait, what? Yes. Uh, fa uh, Fahrenheit. <laughs> Yes. What? Oh, oh my God. So do you immediately pass I out? So, I love y'all so much because the air is off because of the sound. So I'm, I am, I am, you know. I was saying it's going to be hot. Okay, you hot. Okay, okay. <laughs> So for those who are watching us on YouTube, you're going to see just a few great drops of sweat. You'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's 120. <laughs> so, oh my listen, God. That's listen, that is that is wild. The fact that literally Earth can get that hot just on a regular Douglas day is wild. Yeah, it's wild. Crazy. All right, so we'll we'll try to get through this uh, <laughs> uh, quickly ish, so that you can turn the air back on. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I was, I'm not as acquainted with you, so I'm super excited to talk to you, Ben, and just to get to know you. Um, I took a peruse through your Instagram to kind of get a little, uh, you know, knowledge and get a feel for you. And the first thing that struck me was your bio, because I've never seen that bio in my life. And, you know, like, I'm on Instagram all the time. We have all these guests. I've seen lots of different bios, but your bio just hits a little bit different. You literally say, I'm black, I'm a minister, and I'm gay. Yeah, right off the bat, you go. <laughs> just like, let me just like lay it out. <laughs> but this conversation is about unboxing labels and beyond those labels and beyond those things that you identify as and maybe what people may say about you, who do you say that you are beyond that? Um, I am love. Oh, um, I am laughter. I am joy. Um, yes. Most importantly, I am free. Ooh. Free to be who I am, free to be who the divine created me to be. And I am obligated um, to my brothers and sisters and those in between to help them see the light as well. Um, so I, I am all of those things everywhere I go. Um, you know, uh, my twin can tell you, you know, I walk into a room, it lights up because that's the energy yeah. I exude. And we're going to laugh. We don't even <laughs> say anything. We gonna, <laughs> you know, life is already hard. Um, yeah. I make it more harder. So, yes, I'm love, I'm laughter, and I'm freedom. Oof, I mm -hmm. love that. Don't you love, Alicia, how everyone has a different answer? I just, we ask that question to all of our guests because we have such dynamic, multi hyphenate people on this show that we're like, wow, like, who are you outside of all that? And I just love that answer. That's definitely one of my top five favorite. Oh, um, yeah. Especially the love part. And I'm free. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. It's, it's for me, um, 
there is no greater force than love. Like if we can, I get it. We all have differences. There are different things. And, but if you can just get back to the loving part, um, I was watching a movie and there was a couple and they were going through all of these issues and challenges. And I don't remember if it was the man or the woman or the who it was, but they literally asked their partner, when can we get back to the loving part of who we are? Mm. And if we can do that as humans, not necessarily in a romantic relationship, but we are all interconnected. If we can truly get back to the loving part of our nature, yeah. I get it. There are people who have challenges, lots of them, mental and otherwise. Um, but if we all can get to the core tenets, which is you are a human. And because I love me, I also love you. So I won't seek to hurt you because hurting you hurts me because we are interconnected. Yeah. And when it comes to being free, which is something that so many are not, um, your experience in choosing a path that is contrary um, to what most people believe in Christianity and in religion, like what has that experience been like, like choosing a different path? Because it's not easy. Um, It absolutely is not easy. And thank you for that question. Um, You know, people taking it back a few steps, you know, tell me that, you know, it's impossible for you to have been born gay. It's impossible. You know, you can't be born gay. That's not how God designed it. And considering how gay people are treated all over the world, uh, people in the LGBTQIA uh, space, who would choose to be treated that way? Who would choose to show up in the world and be discriminated against, marginalized, killed? They still kill people in a lot of uh, uh, Islamic nations for being gay and a lot of African countries for being gay. So uh, I wake up every day choosing to go against the grain. Mm. I wake up every day and make a conscious choice to put my life on the line, to put my uh, heart on the line, to put my um, uh, 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 esteem on the line. I thank God, you know, you know, I am who I am. And I don't a lot of it. I, uh, you said we can cuss on here. We can cuss. We can cuss. Yeah, fuck we can what cuss. anybody else thinks, um, because I'm free. Mm-hmm. And so it was initially a very, very gruesome journey because I had to undo everything that I've been taught about myself. Mm-hmm. I had to let go of people who I esteemed and held very dearly, including my own mother. Mm-hmm. I had to release the narratives, the negativity. Um, that caused me to to self-hate and all the while um, try to maintain some sense of sanity. Yeah. Because I'm facing messages that say I'm less than. I'm facing messages that say I'm going to hell. I'm facing messages that say, you know, I'm an abomination. And above all that, I had to forgive myself because I was embarrassed because I spent years as a minister preaching that homosexuality was wrong and preaching that gay people are going to hell. And here I am, the biggest queer and the biggest gay. You know, I've always, I've always, I grew up in church, at least you grew up in church. And I've always wanted to kind of have that part of the conversation just to kind of touch on that a little bit, because it's not a conversation being had where it's like, obvious the choir director's gay. Like, I mean, yeah. It's like clear that he is flaming. Like, I don't understand like why there's like this unspoken kind of an acceptance, right? Because it's like, okay, obviously he's gay, but we're just not going to talk about it. And we're just going to have random prayer sessions about it every once in a while and throw a little shade and make sure he goes to the altar every, every revival and things like that. Right. That's what I grew up seeing with like the gay choir director or the gay men in church that were obviously homosexual or bisexual or any other sexual, it was obvious to us, but for some reason there just wasn't a conversation. Um, So I'm curious as to what is that experience like from your end when it's like, hey, 
I, I'm being myself. I don't think I'm, I, it's really hard to just a hundred percent hide it. And then having those people who may have assumptions or like, what is that space like for someone from your end, from your perspective, being in the church before you were able to be as free as you are now? Yeah, I want to uh, read a quote from Michael Eric Dyson. Okay. Then answer the question. He said, one of the most painful scenarios of black church life is repeated every Sunday after Sunday with little notice or collective outrage. A black minister will preach a sermon railing against sexual ills, especially homosexuality. At the close of the sermon, a soloist who everybody knows is gay will rise to perform a moving number. Right. As the preacher extends an invitation to visitors to join the church, the soloist is in effect being asked to sign his theological death sentence. His presence at the end of such a sermon symbolizes a silent endorsement of the preacher's message. Ironically, the presence of his gay Christian body at the highest moment of worship also negates the preacher's attempt to censure his presence, to erase his body, to deny his legitimacy as a child of God. And so every time I got up and preached against who I am, I was signing my death certificate. Every time I stood up and said amen to the preacher who said gays are going to hell and, and gays are perverts and freaks and all, I was signing my death sentence. Um, and so it is a psychological warfare. Yeah, I would I, imagine so. I preach today about uh, not sitting uh, under the tyranny of a terror that comes from the pulpit for, for all people, not just queer people. Stop sitting and letting a human being stand up and judge you for being who God created you to be. So my my kind of, uh, I guess the quandary for a lot of people, like if you do, if you are Christian and you are following the Bible word for word, I know nowadays it's a little bit, is a, there's a lot more room for interpretation and removal of things and people have a lot of different views. But for like an old school Christian that's been in church for 50 years and if the Bible says something plainly, or if it says something specifically that this is a problem, this is this, homosexuality is an abomination or whatever the things that they preach about, what are they really supposed to, how should they, How? what's a better way that they can deal with that based on the fact that they feel like they're preaching their yeah. beliefs based on the Bible that they're following? Th does that make sense? Like, Because right. sometimes that's for me what's confusing. Like, I'm not always sure why people are hard on Christians for their beliefs based on the Bible that they follow that states the beliefs that they are preaching. Right. So the first thing I do is take people down a history lesson. Okay. Um, the word homosexual didn't get entered into the Bible until 1946. Hmm, interesting. A group of theologians who were updating the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, and they were changing like words like pervert and pedophile into homosexual. And there was another theologian at Yale University who wrote a letter and said, if you change these words to homosexual, you will then weaponize the faith against a group of people. They said, oh, you're right, but they did it anyway. They didn't undo it until 1977. By then, the damage had been done. And so what I tell people is, if you believe that hell is real, right? If you believe that people are going to spend an eternity burning forever, how come you can cast them there so easily? What does that say about you? Right, because I know that 120 degrees right now, if hell is hotter than that, then... <laughs> man, man. <laughs> that ain't, I'm in Miami and I'm just like, Lord, if this and hell is hotter than this, I don't want to go there. I I'm not going to keep up over there. I right? text my brother, I said, do you want to go to hell? Hell no, it's 120 degrees here. <laughs> And so you have to first, if you're going to send somebody to eternal damnation, know what you're talking about. And it is impossible. It is impossible for you to take everything in the Bible at face value. That's my issue. Because on the alterations and tampering. And yes. Not even just the tampering. If you read Old Testament to New Testament, it was literally like between the two, God went to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> he dealt <laughs> with a lot of his frustrations <laughs> between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Literally, because in the Old Testament, it was if a child sins, take them out into the community and had a whole community to stone them. 
If your hand offends you, cut it off. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. But like, was that was that a, a was that also not a cultural thing? Yes. No. Yeah. I don't, it, I don't think it was just cultural because that is the commandment that many Christians say. Okay, this is what we're supposed to follow, and Orthodox folks still follow that. They will kill their child. Well, I think they, they're, but I think they're not applying it to culture. I mean, back then humans were way more barbaric and some of those things were normal behavior outside of the Bible. Like, so for me, it, for Christians, I agree with you who don't kind of understand that, hey, a lot of this is based on the culture at that time. And the Bible obviously is written, obviously like when the Bible is talking about like chariots and horses and things that just did not exist yet, I just think some of that, especially like the cutting off the, the, the take out your eye, if it offends some, you look at something, whatever. Like, I think things like that are cultural based on the fact that at that time, like when you broke a law, that's the shit that would happen to you. Like they will stone you outside of the Bible. <laughs> like that had nothing to do with it. I mean, they was hanging niggas on crosses. Like the people were different. Okay. Like they were a little bit more animalistic and, and brutal, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I feel like we're going backwards these days, but <laughs> back then I, I definitely agree with you, but I just also think that a lot of it was more culturally based. And for some reason, a lot of Christians miss that, yeah, yeah. Um, especially the older school kind of throwback, you well, know. Uh, a, a lot of stuff that I preach today is about historical context which most people don't know. 80% of Christians don't read their Bible. Right. And have never read it cover to cover. Don't study their Bible, don't understand what it is. And John Grossman said, it's not that ancient people told uh, literal stories and we're now smart enough to take them symbolically. They told symbolic stories and we're now dumb enough to take them literal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so people, when I sit down and have conversations about God, and I really, that's so funny, Alicia, about God going to therapy. I'm going to use that. Therapy. That is funny. I'm going to use that too. That's hilarious. <laughs> but I ask people, okay, if God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, right? In the Bible, in the Old Testament, if a child, you know, as you said, misbehaved, they got stoned. If a woman got raped, she had to marry her rapist. Marry Slay him. Slavery was okay. So if God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, when we get to heaven, will it be okay to stone children to death? When we get to heaven, will it be okay for men to rape women? When we get to heaven, will it be okay to have slaves? Because how is God the same yesterday, today, and forevermore? And now, oh, that's just the Old Testament. That was the old God. I don't understand. No. You're not making logical sense of your faith. Um, and we don't understand that the Bible has been used to manipulate mankind since mankind started learning how to read and write. And a lot of the things, anything, my strong belief is there's no perfect book on this earth that talks about God. Every book has man's fingerprint on it. But anything that is counter to love, I believe is counter to God. And so you read the Bible and you look for stories of love. They asked Jesus, what's the greatest command of all? Jesus said, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And you can hang every other law on those two things. And that is what I argue every single time somebody says anything to me about anything else. It said, you can cast out demons in my name. Ooh. You can, listen, I know I know the scripture. I'm not religious. I can call her grandma, grandma, because she, she always like, I don't believe it. I'm not religious. And then, and then it's every, every episode, I swear to you, Ben, she is quoting a Bible scripture. It'll be about the Bible. It'll be, we could be talking about popping our pussy on the handstand. And she's like, well, you know, one time in the Bible. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> because just because I don't believe in religion doesn't mean I don't believe in love God. Yes. I believe in love God. I just don't want shit to do with none of his religions. I'm good <laughs> on all of them. Every last one I'm good on. And no disrespect to you, uh, Ben, as a I, minister. At all. I believe that there are many paths, just like Mama O said, there are many pathways to God. I agree with that. Uh, in all of them. Yeah. Whatever your spiritual practice is, whatever your wellness practice is, if your wellness practice calls you to hate another, it's not really a wellness practice. It's not. If your soul practice causes you to uh, put yourself above another, it's not really a good soul practice. And that's what humans 
uh, do naturally. We, we naturally uh, want to make us better than them, whoever the them are. Yeah. And Christians unfortunately make anybody that's not Christian, you know, the devil. Uh, but really the devil is with it. When Jesus came, Jesus' beef was with the church. Literally, that's what his issues is with. Knocking over tables, hitting folks. Listen, get out. And now, of course, for context, they were, you know, they were doing some some little shady stuff in, inside the temple. And he was a little upset about that. But my thing always and, and will forever be is, is if it goes against love, then you you messed up somewhere. Yeah. You messed up somewhere. And but so I completely agree think about that. the psychological warfare, especially for black people that we've had to go through to endure this faith. Slaves were ripped from Africa, their culture, their spirituality, but not just in Africa, in Native America, in Australia, in South America, and we're forced to worship this white God. So we're now praying to a white God to deliver us from white people. Yeah, I, oh, you know, that's so funny you talk about that. I talk about that all the time. Uh, so that's really interesting. I've never heard anyone else talk about it. But I talk about how it fucks up our identity because there's no way that you can, like, we're the only group of people who yeah. converted to a God who who have been forced to uh, originally, right? Some of us, we, we choose to. But the slaves were forced to serve a God that doesn't look like them. Every other culture in the world serves a God who looks like them unless they decide to convert to a different religion. And I think about that all the time. And I, and I say that when it comes to slavery, of course we talk and racism, we always talk about like, obviously the obvious, you know, um, discrepancies and brutalities of it and just how messed up it was. But I'm always talking about how robbed we were of spiritual ascension and and elevation and really meeting our higher selves like our slate our ancestors like never got that chance to like you know what i mean like reach our higher our highest purpose and that for me i think is the worst part i think that's what we're seeing so much of like those that kind of uh the remnants of that is that that lack of spiritual elevation that we just have not had throughout the centuries it's, it's yeah. It is a part of our African heritage and culture. That is why black church is more lively than white church because we've mixed our African heritage and culture in that. Yes. But yeah. the, the terror of the pilgrims is still <laughs> today. It is, but it's real. The evangelicals support this whole, uh, you know, dismantling of Roe versus Wade. Like the, the terror of the pilgrims is still happening today. The terror. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. It is. I don't think it's ever going to stop. Really quickly, really quickly, because I know we're talking about religion, but I don't want us to kind of go too deep down that rabbit hole. We may have to bring you back to have some conversation about religion because we do love to talk about it. But I really want to kind of circle back. You said something about having to let go, um, you know, of even people that may um, not agree with your lifestyle or may feel some type of way and they are just not speaking life into you or you feel like they don't see you. And I know that it's, I know it to be true that just because you identify as a label doesn't mean others will see you or respect you as such. So I wanted to get your perspective because I know that this is a very popular thing right now where people are saying that there's something and they want everyone to agree with that and acknowledge them as such. So how do you handle those who won't acknowledge you for who you say and believe that you are? Um, because I spent years not respecting people's labels mm -hmm. and it an act of God, an act of love to get me to this place of enlightenment, I give those people grace because I know they are speaking from a place of fear and they're speaking from a place of pain and unhappiness. Mm, okay. When you have love for self, you have love for your brother. When you have Regardless. grace, you have grace for your brother. I cannot force you to love me how I need to be loved if you don't love yourself first. And loving yourself is evident in how you love people. And so when you don't respect me for who I am, that is not an uh, that is not indicative of what you think of me. It's a, a resounding alarm of what you think of yourself. So I'm not I, I used to get offended. But when you come to a place of love and enlightenment, child, these people, <laughs> I understand because I used to be them. And that is why I can give them grace in that space. 
and uh, choose if I want to continue to be in relationship or whatever the connection is and guide them on this journey of love um, and equity because everybody um, isn't exposed to this new space of people showing up authentically and, and unapologetically. So how do we shepherd people into this new space? And you can't do it by rejecting them or, or combating with them because you ain't gonna change nobody. But I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna be all the things that I wanna be, whether you call them me that or not. Ooh, you, you just said a, a mouthful there, especially the piece that stood out the most for me is, is people aren't used to people living their truth. If you think about it, how how things have always been, and I even think about my childhood um, and those who have heard this podcast before, y'all know I grew up in a borderline cult. There was a lot of pedophilia. Um, there was a lot of there just folks being being raped and molested and just all the things. There was a lot of it, <clears throat> a lot of abuse, right? Um, and back then it literally was you don't show people your undergarments. You have a representative that you put on when you come out of the house. You wear that representative all day long. You don't make too much noise. You don't let your undergarments show. And then when you get back home, then you can take off you know, your, your representative and you can be yourself again. So if you was tan to mess up or you was whooping the shit out of your wife at home, y'all would get dressed for work. Once you get dressed for work, or get dressed for, for church, you put on your nice little suit, you put on your nice little, you know, your little shoes, your little kitten heels, you go with your kids, you, you go on up to the church service, you sit on the front row, amen, pastor it up, you get back home and whoop the shit out of her that night, because you ain't got to go back until Wednesday, my day and her bruises, will be, she'll be able to cover them with makeup. So for people to be um, proud of who they are and be okay with who they are and identify with who they feel they are, that is something that is different. So giving grace is something that you will have to do because people are just used to meeting their representative. Yeah. So that's the one thing that is standard for, for most humans. You're going to meet this representative and you're going to be good with it. Yeah. But I will say, too, labeling, though, is how humans process information. Uh, yeah. Poison versus, you know, safe child versus adult. Um, labeling is, is, is how we, it's, it's our innate need to, to quantify and to qualify our world. And so labels now, or, or now we're saying that, okay, labels, labels have like a, they're getting a bad rap, but how has embracing the labels that you actually do identify with, how has it helped you to step into your power? Cause I actually like a little label sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes I don't depending on the, the, the mood. Hello. I, I, as you said, we need labels. As much as people say, you know, I don't like labels, our brains can't operate without. Yeah. We need to identify something and give voice to it, whatever it is, so that our brains can say, hey, that's a woman. Hey, that's a man. Hey, that's a gay person. Hey, she's black. Because it's 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 innate to our, our cognition. We can't stop it. Um, but it took me years to embrace all the labels that I am. And when I was telling my story, um, as I was coming out, I would tell this elaborate, long story just to get to I'm gay. And people would be looking at me like, if you don't just spit it that out, what the hell are you talking about? What? And then I finally say, I'm gay. Oh, that's what you were saying? Okay, where are we going to lunch? Um, and my aunt, um, she was one of the first uh, adult relatives I came out to, and I'm crying, telling this story about freedom and being myself. And she's looking at me smiling. I'm like, what the hell is this lady smiling at? She was like, say it. I'm like, say what? She was like, say it. I don't know what you... And I said, I'm gay. That was the first time in my life, that was 2016, that I had said proudly without shame that I was gay. I've been gay all my life, but it took me 30 years to say it without shame. And so when I start telling my story, when I label the title of my book, when I get up and give speeches, I open up with that. I open up with that who I, because it is, it is an act of bravery, it is an act of defiance, 
it is an act of true, true authenticity to be able to stand strongly and proudly. And so, and I also did not stand fully in my queerness until 2020. Mm. And that was six years after I came out, 2020, 2021, I realized I was still being the safe gay. Mm. I was being the conservative gay. I was being the gay that would still be welcome with the bras and, you know, you won't be able to see me walking down the street like, oh, he's gay. And I realized I was still living for other people's opinions and I had to stop that. And so embracing all of who you are, whether you put a label on it or not, is a lifelong journey. And I'm still yet on that journey. What advice do you have for um, all, all people, but especially young people who are kind of struggling with that? I don't like calling it an identity crisis, but struggling just with their identity and with their labels and just trying to kind of figure themselves out because I know more recently, be, and I, I think exposure has something to do with it and just having more information to kind of process as a young person. You know, growing up, there were certain things you didn't see on television, so you didn't even think about it. Um, it just, even if you were feeling it, you couldn't always put a name to it or put a label to it because it wasn't anywhere else. If you were feeling attraction to someone of the same sex, you weren't always sure what that really meant or what that was. Media and social media especially has put a lot of um, definition to things that young people wouldn't have had before. So I know that even though it's the representation is great, it can also lead to a lot of confusion because it's just an overload of information. So I know it it causes people to be like, am I this, am I that? And you feel this need to kind of figure it out because there's so many labels. So what advice do you give, especially people who are now coming into that journey in this kind of a world? That is such a loaded question (laughs) (laughs) because there's so much advice to give. Good. Give us some. Give them some. They need it. It is, it is, it is, it is a layered, layered journey. Yeah. First thing you need to do is be delivered from the opinions of people. Oof. If you are living your life trying to please everyone, you will please no one. If you are living your life according to standards that are not assigned to your destiny, your purpose, your being you will always be ashamed to be anything that shows up in your list of labels because we all have a list of labels. It's not one. And the thing about the black experience, because I talk extensively about what I know, is that we are not given the space to explore who we are. We're not given the space to determine if I am that label. We allow people to throw labels on us and we keep them. Just because a man is feminine doesn't mean he's gay. Oh, uh, look, he, look at that little sissy. Look at that faggot. He's gay. And he's like, well, am I gay? I don't know. I just, I'm feminine. And so the first thing you need to do is get delivered from the opinions of people. The second thing you need to do is safely find a space and a community. And I know a lot of people live in rural America and these communities aren't available, but you have a mobile phone any way that you can get online and find a support group, they're out there. Find a community and space where you can explore who you are safely. Where you explore the things you like, the things you don't like. Don't share it with people who don't understand because that pressure to live up to their standard will always be there. And if you're not sure who you are, their opinion can sway you from becoming who you are. And so it's so important to find a space where you can safely explore who you are, whether that is online. I started safely exploring being gay online in chat rooms on AOL, um, on Black Planet, um, you know, all these different places. Where Not Black Planet. He's bay- taking us back. Bay- bay. You yeah. showing your age, man. You showing your age now. <laughs> I, I am proud. I am a proud uh, older millennial. Uh, <laughs> But uh, and finding that safe space and then and once you find that community, um, get rid of all of the things everybody told you you should be. If it doesn't agree with you, let it go. And that's from career, lifestyle, who you love, how you show up in the world, how you dress. A lot of girls like to dress, you know, a little masculine. Don't mean that they're lesbians, but they like to dress masculine, like to wear suits and you know, and people have told them, oh, you're a tomboy. 
you're a lesbian. No, how I show up in the world, how I dress is not my sexual orientation. So get rid of the labels that were assigned to you that aren't you. Mm. And, and you're able to freely explore who you are. I really like what you said, and it reminded me of a situation with my daughter. So um, I believe it was last year, maybe 2020. I know it was during the pandemic. You know, the pandemic has lasted so long. We just years. You just never know which one it was. Um, but she told me she's like she was gay. And I guess she expected me to. Oh, my God, you did it. And I was like, OK, cool. Well, you hungry? Like what? We Like, I don't understand. Like. I think she was looking for me to trip out or spaz out. Now, mind you, my daughter doesn't know my exploits as a grown person. So, you know, my good sis don't know all of the, you know, the the um, experiences that I have had. And so I guess she expected me to judge her or whatever else. And I was just like, OK, now in my mind and I, I, I said, honestly, I did not believe she was gay because Sanaya has loved boys since before she could talk real good. She been trying to kiss and rub on little boys since she was a little, little girl. And so I, in my mind, I'm like, eh, I don't think so. But if you think so, okay. I said, I'm going to allow you to figure this out for yourself. When she said she wanted purple hair, okay, sis, because I too feel as though black kids aren't allowed the freedom and the space to explore. It's always, no, you represent the entire culture. The entire culture is on your head. And if you make a mistake, they're not going to let any other black people through. So you can't. And I said, you know, I don't want her growing up with that type of pressure. I'm going to allow her to figure out who she is. And she came back to me six months later. She's like, ma, she's like, okay, so I'm not gay. I do like boys, but I am thankful that you didn't try and talk me out of it. And you let me figure it out myself. And I never even thought of it until you just said something that they're not allowed to explore. And then they adopt something that they might not even have been because of the pressure of the people who are around them. And two, not equating the way someone dresses to their sexuality. It could just be that that is what they're most comfortable with. Yeah. And it's even, I think it even goes beyond, there's so much to unpack there, but I think it even goes beyond sexual orientation. Like it could be something like, oh, you're a bitch. And someone telling you that your whole life. And it's just like, I'm not though. Like I know for me growing up, that was like a very big, like that I was like, I'm a bitch. And it's like, oh, I have bitch moments. <laughs> bitch you know like it's just like my heart is too big i'm too giving i'm too warm like i care way too much about people all the things <laughs> about, yeah about all the things like i like it's just like the way i love for that to be the label because i know what i want a lot of times and because i'm particular and because i'll say hey not this but that it gives that vibe and that energy, I think. But for me, I would, I felt like sometimes you even will step into a label and start kind of becoming that label, even though that's not who you are, but that's what people expect of you. Does that make sense? Like, I feel like there were times where I was just like being that because that's what people expected of me, even though that wasn't true to who I really felt like I was, but I was just gonna be that because that's what you're asking for or people will try to bring it out of you based on how they see you. Yeah. You know, so I I 100% agree with, you know, shedding the labels that people put on you and making sure that you're having the conversations with yourself and doing the inner work so you can realize which ones apply and which ones don't. Like if it don't apply, let it fly and don't just sit in those labels because someone else said that that's who you are. You know, and I, like, I, I definitely experienced that when you said that. I was like, wow, that's really true. Like, I don't feel like that, but I've definitely stepped into it because someone said that's who I was. Yeah, We, we are social creatures. Yeah. And we don't want to do anything to disrupt social order. Yeah. Mm. Well, if bitch is the thing that welcomes you into that social order and that's what everybody expects you to be and you want to show up and yeah. be that bitch to to operate in that space, then that's what we adopt. And yeah. so. You know, people expected me to be the upright, the astute, the smart. And so I held on to the conservative one. Ben don't ever do anything wild. Ben don't ever do it. So I tried to live up to that standard. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Beyond sexuality, it was all these things. Ben is, you know, all the parents like Ben. Ben obeys. Ben listens. So everywhere I went, that's what I tried to be. 
because that's where I received love. And whether the love was toxic or not, well, love can't be toxic. Whether the action was toxic or not, mm. I interpreted that as love. But was any of that who a part of you, like some of the labels that people put on you, was some of that true? Like, are you kind of a more conservative person in some ways? Are you like a good, like a good boy? You know, like, is that who you were? I am. I, I am a good boy. Or, and I also was a good boy for acceptance. Mm, but you had like something rebellious that you wanted to do wild things. <laughs> Listen, that's why I say me and Ben are twins. The reason me and Ben are twins because I'm the loud one. I'm the, listen, I said it, I did it. That's what we going with. And Ben was always the twin when we first met. Now, not anymore. When we first met, Ben was the one who was, no, he gone. He, you were. Like when we first met, you you were in line. You were the conservative. And I was saying the wild shit. And I feel like that's honestly, too, how we connected. So because I would say it out loud, you would think it in your head. <laughs> and we would look at each other. <laughs> <laughs> but I always wish, though, honestly, that I was. It's so crazy, Danny, when you say that. I always wish that I was considered a better child because people thought I was this wild child. I was this whore. I wasn't even having sex when they were calling me a whore. I literally started having sex because I was like, what do you think I'm fucking anyway? I might as well. Literally. That is into the role because it just, it just, it, that's how they see you anyway. So I might as well just be that. And that's such a, if it's not, because I, I definitely think that you can be and, right? Like at least you love the word and. Like you can be conservative and wild. Like you can be all the things all at the same time. Like our experience is not that, like they say healing isn't linear. Like no, like human experience is not linear. Like you're not a linear person where you're only this thing. And that for me sometimes is my problem with labels is like, if you're this, you can't be that. Like there is no, there isn't a lot of room for like, like for instance, it's always hard for me to pick like a political party affiliation because I can, I'm a person that, I can see both sides of arguments. Like I feel like it's a gift that I have where I can listen to two people talk and I can like, your opinion might be really fucked up, but I can see why you would say that. I I feel like I always pray for understanding and I just believe it's a gift that I, that I have been bestowed upon me because I really care and all you're getting get understanding and I really care about understanding. So for me, when someone has like an argument about something or political a party affiliations and things like that, it's like hard for me to always choose because I'm always like, but I see both sides. Like I, this person has great points, that person has great points. It'll come down to food. Like I'm just like, mm, I don't want just chicken. I want chicken and fish. I want mm -hmm. all the things. So I know that that sometimes is a difficult space to be in when you're always told if you're this, you can't be that, right? Like if you're Christian, you can't be gay. If you're a woman, you can't be this. Like everything is this thing prevents you or restricts you from being all these other things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I know that that's where the internal conflict comes from when you are that thing and that is who you are, but then you're all these other things, but someone says that you're not, or you can't be, you know, I think that that can be really, really, um, it can create a lot of angst inside, especially when you're a young person. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, we can disagree on much, actually we can disagree on most, so long as your disagreement doesn't um, hinder my humanity. Yeah, I agree with that. And so I can see both sides, but as soon as one of something that you believe hinders me from being a full person, then it's not a matter of disagreement anymore. It is a matter of right and wrong. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think too, and that actually leads to, to my, my, my next question, is is so we've been having lots of conversations, especially with like the changing around uh, labeling. Um, and in many of our conversations, what we've been finding is, is that some of the more inclusive labels, um, they're starting or having an opposite effect from changing woman to or, or mother to like birthing person or to a menstruator. Um, what it what it does is it can kind of feel more like erasure than uh, than inclusion, because if you take away the word mother and just name me a birthing person, now what you've done is you turn me into a verb. I'm not a human anymore. 
You turn me into a verb where I'm only good to get the soul here. But after that, a gun has more rights than I do. Like, or if you just say I'm just a menstruator, then oh, okay, I'm just this thing that bleeds again. So that we can hopefully I'm just this thing that bleeds so that again we can get souls to the earth. So I'm literally, I'm just the, the human that does the doing. I'm no longer a human being, I am just the human doing, and my doing is only relevant when it serves your purpose, right? And so, and this you may not even have the answer to this, but like. What do you believe is a better approach to ensure that inclusion, like it actually serves its intended purpose for all? Because just like with diversity, equity and inclusion, we're not saying that we no longer want any more white people to be in organizations or a part of, 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 of businesses or part of ideas. We're not saying that. We're saying and we also want persons of color to not only be included or not only be able to be in the room and have a seat at the table, but also have a voice that moves and impacts decisions. And so yeah. what is that like when it comes to all of the new labels? Because I think that having or being able to put a name on something is important. It absolutely matters. I'm in total agreement with you. The moment it erases your humanity, it's a, it's, that's it. End of conversation. Ain't no more love because you just erased me. And so how can we, or, or what do you believe, if you have it, is, is a better approach to you know, just ensure it, it truly is inclusive and not erasing one to honor, amplify, or lift up another? Um, well, first of all, you know, you know I'm, not, I'm not a woman or a menstruator. Uh, <laughs> so I cannot I speak, think so. I can't speak from that experience, but what I can say from a human experience is that uh, being inclusive means making room. Yes. And sometimes making room is uncomfortable because some making room means that the seat that you held freely for so long is now being welcome for other people to have. And people think that they hold on to that seat solely. It wasn't that you held onto it solely, it was there was no space yet for the other people who could sit in that seat as well. And so I think the better way is um, having more conversations so that people who sit, who were sitting in the seat don't feel like something's being taken away from them. Yeah. For instance, the white people that go around shooting people, the young man who uh, shot the people who were sitting up in the church, he was literally peddling the same old narrative that white people use to recruit people into these militia groups and these terrorist groups is that they're taking from us. They're taking our jobs. They're taking our women. He literally said that's why he shot up the black church. Yeah. And giving space to black people is not us taking your jobs and taking your women. It is giving us something that you held so freely for all of your life. And so including more humans into the birthing process requires a label change because not only just mothers birth children or not only people who identify as mothers birth children, but transgender uh, women or trans, trans transgender, men. transgender men birth children, non-binary people birth children. And so from a, um, from a uh, political standpoint, you have to change the label to be included. From a conversational familial standpoint, it's still nothing wrong with calling a woman mother. Like, I don't think adding birthing person and menstruator takes away from the titles that you hold and will continue. Uh, but I think from a, a political perspective and a, a policy perspective, and then, uh, because when, when you, a, a lot of this is needed. So when you're fighting for rights, I'm not just fighting for women who were born women and assigned a female at sex. I'm fighting for birthing rights of a trans. I'm fighting for birthing rights of a non-binary person. And so I think with all this newness and this age, why you know, politicians are afraid, um, you know, they're creating laws, don't say gay bills. But the kids don't care and they're showing up free and it's making adults afraid because it's creating space that they haven't created before. So I think we need more conversations to help people understand a plus for them is not a minus for you. 
a plus for them is just welcome them finally to the table because they weren't for so long. Trans people aren't new. Trans males aren't new. Non-binary people aren't new. This is just a time in our history where we are welcoming them with open arms and trying to face so a better way for conversation to help people do hold that space. Nothing's taken away. We're just making space for other people. Yeah, and I think like I understand what you're saying about the label. I don't think I don't agree with there being a label change. I think there can be a label addition. I don't think we should only use the term birthing person because other people need to be included. You need to say mothers, but like say it all. Like we can say LGBTQIA, whatever, everything, right? Plus, then we can also we can maybe get a let's get a um some initials going. I don't know, but I I don't agree. I don't agree with the label change because I think that it's important for those labels to be specified because like Alicia said, it definitely does feel like erasure. I'm okay with including, um, but there needs to still be um, some kind of a, a specification of who everyone is based on the fact that a birthing person, if you're a birthing person and you're not biologically a woman, your experiences are going, well, well you can't birth if you're not biologically a woman. What am I trying to say? Um, if you are a person that you feel like, hey, I was born a woman and I'm deciding to be a man, your experiences as far as what your body goes through for birth is still going to be similar or exactly the same, actually, as a woman who still identifies as a woman, a biological woman who still identifies as a woman, it's still going to be the same overall process. But I don't think that because she is deciding or yeah, she's decide. They are deciding that hey, I'm now a man. That it takes a. It just feels like it takes away from women who are still identifying as women. For everyone to just say, oh well, because now they dis they are now a man. It's a birthing person. Does that make sense? I'm trying to use the right pronoun, so I'm yeah. trying not to be confusing. But I'm gonna just say they. That for women, a lot of times can feel very. Um, it just doesn't. It just doesn't feel good. When, when someone says that I'm a menstruator or I'm a birthing person because I need to include other people who have different identities and things that they identify as. Um, just like we spoke about earlier, and I appreciate you trying to be as politically correct and as safe as possible. Because <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, maybe the way I was like, oh, how am I saver? How am I saver? <laughs> Yeah, I be trying. I be trying to stay. I'm like, okay, how do I say this? <laughs> say, say all the pronouns and all the things? I'm trying. I'm trying. I think. I mean, and this was not a Macy Gray moment. I think. Yeah. Give people I think I'm clear. I think I was clear. I think so. Yes, you have to give people agency and space to uh, give language to what they're feeling without yeah. you know uh, uh, immediately attacking them, right? Especially. Yeah if you're coming from a good space. Uh, Macy Gray jumped into the conversation uh, where she didn't need to on a show of a man who is just a, a jerk, ignorant, bigoted, racist, trash. So how dare you go on his show and talk about something that nobody asked you about. No one cares what you think um, and now you're in trouble. Um, but I believe that like we talked about earlier in the show, just because somebody labels it doesn't mean you have to accept that label. And so when you go around filling out your application, put mother. When you go around filling out your application, put woman. When the doctors, you know, say, mislabel you and say birthing person, you say no, uh, mother. Like it is okay for you. I, I really appreciate, uh, I believe your initial answer was, don't just replace the entire thing, just expand. Mm. Plus, yeah, I don't care about that. That's great. That's cool with me. Yeah, and I think that's the conversation that needs to be had more because, like Alicia said, inclusion can't be erasure and and replacement of. It's like, no, we can all be all these things. Like yeah. women, yeah. we can be people, we could be menstruators, we could be everything. Because I know that that you know when I see that stuff, it just doesn't make me feel good. And just kind of leads right into the last question of while labels can be useful, we obviously have talked about how limiting they can be. Um, mm -hmm. But I love 
been your perspective on all of this. So just to kind of put a bow on it, how do you honor all the parts of yourself and not allow your label to be a box? Because we can say that we're so free, right? And like we we feel good and I'm out and I'm and I'm being all the things, but then you get into a space where now that's all you can be too, right? Like you come out as a black gay minister and then that's a box and a label that you can feel trapped in. Like I've seen people say like, hey, I, I uh, became, I came out as trans and 30 years later, I, I want to go back to my biological sex and I'm too scared to do that now because of this box that people have accepted maybe and put me in. And, you know, so sometimes the labels that initially make you feel free can also start to feel restricting as well. Yeah. So I want to know kind of how you navigate that and honor all the parts of yourself that may be outside of that box that, you know, that you've been navigating. Uh, that is absolutely a valid question because gay men, I know, I can, I, can, I can only speak from my experience, experience that as well. Like, I might end up with a woman. Really? You know, not because... Uh, we have to talk about, you got to expound on that. Hold on, we need to talk about that because we don't really hear gay men say that. What's the perspective there? I am not actively pursuing a relationship with a woman. Okay. I will not put any definites on my future. Interesting. Um, so okay. it, as we think about the spectrum of sexuality, the spectrum of identity, the spectrum of culture, all of those things, that we make space for people who move up and down the continuum. Mm, I love that. Or at our current state, who I am today at 37 years old is not who I was at 27. Right. Not who I was at 17. I have uh, thankfully, prayerfully advanced in my thought, advanced in my interest, things that I used to like. Like yeah. I'm going through that right now where I boldly say, I have a book out that says, I'm Polly and most likely so are you. As I explore these dirty streets that I'm tired <laughs> of, say, I think I'm changing. I don't want to be Polly no more. I want <laughs> The Polly streets was real, huh? <laughs> the human- You said dirty? I can't. Humans have taxed me to death. I'm sick of them. And so I just- <laughs> <laughs> to be worried about and let's live this good life. <laughs> I, I, I'm ready to stop. I'm, I'm, I'm stop. It was too much. It, it gave way more than it was supposed to give. It was too much. When I was younger, I had all the energy, baby. The stamina, the energy. Smack that down, smack that down. Smack. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired. I want to I lay down with one... <laughs> Enjoy the rest of my life. So yeah. I've been on public platforms. I've been on television as recently as last month saying this. <laughs> and here I am today saying, shit, that's a lie. Uh -uh. So I, it was my truth at that moment. Yes. No longer my truth right now. And we have to give yeah. ourselves space to live in our truth always. As I said at the start of the show, we will identify labels along this journey and that journey is never ending. Yeah. We grow as we learn, as we experience, as we shift in our interests, as we shift in our personalities and moods, as we get older, things change. Mm. If you are trying to hold on to the 27 year old label of yourself and you are 10 years past that, you mm. are doing yourself a disservice. And so yeah, and it doesn't make me flighty either. I think that's the fear is it makes you come off as like a flighty, unstable, a uh, person who doesn't know themselves if you're kind of always changing or contradicting yourself. Well, so how me, that came from, that came from colonialism and white supremacy. Ooh, tell me more. This cultures, in our African cultures, we celebrated growth. We celebrated growing and being and honoring uh, different spirits, honoring different parts of ourselves. If you study, it's in our history books, African cultures, Native American cultures, there were men who, you know, were dressed as men, then they would be dressed as women, and they would go back and be dressed as men. There were kings and queens who had uh, uh, le lesbian lovers and gay lovers, and, and they went back to marrying, you know, uh, so. They sisters. There's all of that. Whiteness came in and said, the way you all are living so freely is savagery. Mm. And 
Mm -hmm. Biden made all of these strict boxes on how to live. That's People were free all over the world. So that way of thinking is an, 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 an ancient European style of seeing the world. Interesting. You are free to be who you are. You are tapping into your African ancestral indigenous spirit that is causing you to morph and elevate. If a caterpillar remained a caterpillar and never morphed into a butterfly, then it would never be serving its purpose. And people three on the ground watching that butterfly fly. Oh, he's so flighty. Cause he's supposed to be sweetie. <laughs> Hello. But that's so interesting that that thought process or that the way you put that, that savage, they classified savagery, classified freedom as savagery. And of yes. course, savages are deemed dangerous yes. and a threat. So, oh my God, that just, I don't know why that just sent off like this huge ass light bulb in my brain. Like I never thought about that. They weren't savages, they were free. And that was the threat. That is what was going to threaten this view they had of the new world. So that is yeah. so fascinating. I never thought about it that way. Uh, sexuality, when we would see our um, African people on the cover of National Geographic and breast just- See out. that, coochie eye, <laughs> penis, just a dangling. What what whiteness came and said dress all the way up to here, but that's because they didn't know how to take baths and they had sores all over their. First of all, I'm not doing this with you. I was politically correct, man. What happened to political correct? <laughs> <laughs> he said they, they still don't take some of them still don't take baths. It was a whole debate on social media. Yes, they wash once or twice a week. It's cultural for them. That ain't cultural for us. Times <laughs> a day. We why not? We never lose who we were as ancient beings. Yeah, and so you like to bathe often. Uh, uh you smell like outside. Go bathe. It's a snake. No. <laughs> It's true. Everything oh, with a rag, bathe with something just to exfoliate and scrub the dirt off of you, not with your hands and some body wash. That's that's not it, y'all. That's not it. I'm sorry. African Moors who went to Europe and taught Europeans how to bathe. Really? They didn't have any water systems. They didn't, they did they had no. all over their bodies. You go to Africa, the people free, naked, because sexuality wasn't shamed. Sexuality is not seen as savagery. They free. Mm. That is the show enough truth. <laughs> I never even thought about it that way. Listen, <laughs> this conversation, I just feel so light and airy and free. Baby, I'm hot, but I'm light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's one hey, welcome to the Alicia and Ben show, because this is how we act up every <laughs> Listen, and have a good time every time, all the time. But listen, I'm not going to keep you sweating over there. I want to know where can we stay connected? Because Ben, I, I, I truly do love the way you just, A, you lead with love in everything that you do. And the way you explain things and the level of research, it's just, it's a beautiful thing. So I want to thank you too for being love and laughter and freedom because this was beautiful. And I cannot wait for our, our listeners to, to hear this conversation because it, it it blessed my little soul. Well, my big soul, I'm not calling myself little no more. It blessed my big soul. <laughs> well, I, I can't wait for them to hear it either because this was good. <laughs> what you this was good. Y'all, y'all, this was a good time. Um you can connect with me. Um BenjaminCarltonLive.com um, is where all of my stuff is. You can find my book there. I went and purchased the domain blacklovewins.com. Um, that's where you can get my, my book directly because Black Love does win. Um, they, they, they used a lot of Black stories to get the Love Wins campaign going and then drop the Black queer people uh, like a bad habit. <laughs> uh, so that's why I took Black Love Wins. And then I'm on the socials at I, Ben Carlton. Awesome. It. Awesome. I hope, I hope, I know you and Alicia act up. I hope that we can meet in person and we can all act up together. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Because I just feel that it would be a great time. <laughs> Listen, a key and a key. A key and a key and a key, buddy. Okay. So I am here for it. Thank you for sharing your light with us and dropping so much knowledge and giving us a little history lesson. I love history. Mm -hmm. I love new information. So thank you for sharing that with us and with our audience. 
Um, I definitely think a lot of people are going to go do some research and Google. And that's what this is about for us is giving people different tools and different and new information so that they can go and find some of these things on their own and do deeper dives. Right? We only have like an hour with you. So it's like, go do more research, go look some of this stuff up and find out the truth and seek out the truth and seek out understanding so that you can really decide what kind of life you want. It's very difficult to just be spoon fed everything and really step into your best self. Um, you can always stay connected with me at, at Miss Danny Foster on all the social medias. You can go to dannyfostercoaching.com to book me for wellness coaching sessions. You can go to Triggered AF uh, PC at Triggered AF PC for Instagram, triggeredafpodcast.com. You can watch us on YouTube, all the things. And Alicia, where can stay connected with you? All over Beyonce's internet at Alicia Reese. Y'all know it's spelled special, A-L-E-C-H-I-A, but don't worry. By the time it's all said and done, just like you know how to spell Beyonce, you will know how to spell my version of Alicia. <laughs> Hello. So thank you guys so much. Thank you again, Ben, for your time and your energy and your light. And after sitting in this heat, I know you probably don't want to take a good, good, good black shower. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do. You know, we hot. It's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta take, I just want to go home and take a shower. Like, I can't even do it. <laughs> so thank you for, for sitting, in this, and, and sitting in this heat with us. And we hope everyone gains as much knowledge and light and just um, perspective from this conversation that we did. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode of Triggered AF. Remember, don't be consumed by your triggers. Confront it and then work to release it. Whether you leave us more triggered than you came or you're feeling like you've been open to a new perspective, our hope is that you've grown. Make sure to share this episode with a friend who's trigger happy and tag us while you're listening. We can't wait to hear from you. Until next week, pull it together, girl.